But welcome to our webinar. We're going to be talking about um, how to uh, represent um, people with disabilities. Oh, here we go. Practical guidance and ethics in representing disabled clients, including clients who may have diminished capacity or may be viewed as having diminished capacity. So again, I'm Claudia Center, DREDF's legal director, and I'm co-presenting with Aisha Lewis, DREDF staff attorney. And uh, we try to do this training once a year in January, right before everyone has their ethics credit um, trying to um, fulfill before the deadline. Next slide. Okay, so this is a little um, overview of, of what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, I'm gonna go over some of the ethical and legal principles that we wanna keep in mind whenever we're thinking about how to best represent um, people with disabilities as lawyers. Um, Aisha's gonna talk about um, some practical application, some tips and tools, and how supported decision-making may be a tool in your toolbox for representing uh, people with disabilities. Um, supported decision-making often involves including a person as a supporter um, in the representation. And of course, that's gonna raise issues of attorney-client privilege. So I'm gonna go over what we know about attorney-client privilege and how to try and balance those two things. Um, I'm also going to be talking about protective action, which is something we mostly don't have in California. And then we're going to have lots of time for questions and answers. Next slide. Okay, the overview of ethical and legal principles and representing clients with disabilities. Next slide. So who are clients with disabilities? Um, you know, uh, when we, when we first started thinking about people with disabilities in the sort of modern civil rights era, um, we really thought about people who use wheelchairs, people who are blind, people who are deaf, but now, you know, 30 plus years after the Americans with Disabilities Act, I think we all have a much broader view of what um, disabilities are and who our disabled clients may be. Next slide. So we know, um, particularly under you know state law, but even under federal law, which is um, has become broader since 2008, um, clients with disabilities can include people with psychiatric disabilities, mobility disabilities, uh, traumatic brain injury, autism, autistic people, or people with neurodiversity, um, chronic illnesses, which are. Um, you know, tragically um, increasing in our era of COVID and, and long COVID, um, cancer, uh, dementia or Alzheimer's, sensory disabilities like being blind or deaf, learning disabilities, ADHD, and intellectual and developmental disabilities. Next slide. Hello, Claudia, are you taking this? Uh, we do, already did this slide. Okay. So we need to go forward. Okay. So um, do any of our your clients have disabilities? Um, almost certainly some of your clients have disabilities. Um, one in four adults nationwide have um, some kind of disability. And we know there are higher rates of disability among a lot of the populations that are represented by legal services organizations like DREDF, um, including Black and Indigenous people, people living in poverty, unhoused people, people in jail or prisons, um, older adults and veterans. Next slide. Um, so this is an image um, by uh, T.L. Lewis. Um, uh, who is a colleague of ours and a wonderful leader. Um, and it shows how um, poverty, trauma, and disability are intertwined. It's a, um, it's a circle created by three arrows. And one arrow says trauma, and that goes um, clockwise uh, to a second arrow that says disability, and then a third arrow that says poverty that creates the circle. And the idea of this image is that um, these three 
um, factors are all intertwined in our society. So trauma can cause disability, disability can cause poverty, poverty can cause trauma, and so on. So things are very intertwined. Next slide. Okay, so here are some of the things you want to keep in mind when you're representing people with disabilities. Um, so obviously, disability non-discrimination laws. We have the Americans with Disabilities Act, our most famous statute, um, and Title II covers state courts. And in California, our rule of court that governs uh, reasonable accommodations is Rule 1.100. And then Title III applies to law firms and nonprofits and most legal aid organizations. Um, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act um, covers federal agencies and federally funded entities. And so some legal services organizations have um, federal funds. The UNRU Civil Rights Act uh, 51 at SEC uh, covers business establishments. Um, which uh, includes most law firms, or we think includes law firms and organizations. Um, and we also have government code 11135, which covers state agencies and state funded entities. So pretty much everyone should be covered by some disability non-discrimination law in our legal landscape. Next slide. Okay, so what are the core principles of our non-discrimination laws? Um, so this is probably um, a recap for many of you, but we have uh, non-discrimination, obviously, is a core principle, and that would be no garden variety discrimination, like intentional discrimination, but also um, no discrimination that we might think of as um, less intentional. So no policies or practices that screen out disabled clients, even if it's not intentional or even if it doesn't single out people with disabilities. We also um, want to provide reasonable accommodation to people with disabilities. So that's a change in how you do things in order to include a person with a disability. Related is that we want to provide effective communication. That means auxiliary aids and services such as captions, sign language, um, plain language, which we're going to talk about, and so on. Um, I'll also reference that uh, Title II entities and Section 504 entities must meet a standard called program access, which means that your entire program must be um, accessible to and usable by people with disabilities. Next slide. Um, so there's also some California rules of professional conduct that relate to um, serving people with disabilities. So non-discrimination, uh, rule 8.4.1, competence, rule 1.1, the client makes the decisions, rule 1.2, the lawyer must communicate with the client, rule 1.4. So that's gonna intersect with effective communication. You must keep your communications confidential, uh, rule 1.6, and no pr protective action without consent. Um, and we'll talk about that. Next slide. Um, okay, so protective action. Uh, this seems out of order. Is that possible? Yes, I'm sorry. That's Hold okay. On. We'll just wait. Okay, here we go. So um, rule 8.4.1 is, you know, that you can't um, refuse to represent or terminate representation um, uh, using unlawful discrimination against people on the basis of protected act characteristic, and that includes physical or mental disability. Um, so that doesn't mean you have to represent someone just because they have a disability. You can still make your own decisions as a lawyer consistent with the other rules, but it's just that you're not supposed to discriminate in, in representation. Next slide. Okay, so rule 1.2 is about the allocation of responsibility in a representation agreement arrangement. And so you probably learned this in law school, 
that the lawyer is supposed to follow the client's decisions about the objectives of the representation. In other words, the client makes the big decisions about what are the goals, but the lawyer has authority over how to get there and strategies and so on. Um, the lawyer is supposed to reasonably consult with the client as to the means by which the objectives will be achieved. And then, um, you know, you need to communicate. That's rule 1.4. Next slide. Okay, so rule 1.4 is really clear about communication. And I often go back to this rule. I, th I think it helps me make sure I'm communicating properly with clients. So you need to promptly inform a client when disclosure or informed consent is required. You need to explain matters as reasonably necessary to perform to permit, sorry, informed decisions. You want to keep the client reasonably informed about significant developments and promptly comply with reasonable requests for information. And again, uh, consult with the client about the means to achieve objectives, even though the lawyer is, is more the expert on, on the means. Um, next slide. So what's informed consent? It means that the client agrees to a plan of action after the lawyer has communicated and explained the relevant circumstances and the, the risks of, um, of the plan of action, um, whether those are actual risks or reasonably foreseeable or actual adverse consequences um, or reasonably foreseeable adverse consequences. In other words, the pros and the cons. So I focus on this one because, um, you know, informed consent doesn't mean that a client understands every aspect of litigation or the rules of, you know, the California rules of court or the federal rules of civil procedure. It just means that the client needs to understand what the objective is, um, what the plan of action is, and does the client agree with the plan of action, having some understanding of the pros and cons. Um, so, you know, you kind of want to look at this um, um, to understand where the communication has to happen and um, how you, you measure um, capacity as a lawyer, uh, the capacity of your clients. Next slide. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Aisha. Hello, everyone. Um, next, we're going to explore some practical tips and tools for representing clients with disabilities. Um, so the first uh, tip and tool that we have is readily accessible lawyering. And um, as you can see, this is the Ed Roberts campus. Um, it's a universally designed building that's designed to be accessible to people with a wide range of disabilities. And so one of the ways that you can think about access is the physical space. Are you meeting with clients in a place that is accessible to them? Um, next, um, for readily accessible lawyering, you want to make your default practices accessible for a wide range of clients. And you're gonna employ them regardless of whether the client is known to have a disability. And so what are the components of readily accessible lawyering? Um, one big one is plain language. You want to avoid legalese. You want to make sure that the implicit is explicit. Don't assume background knowledge, particularly um, about technical legal things. Um, and then you want humility, curiosity, and attentiveness to clients. Finally, um, trauma awareness is important as well to make your lawyering um, accessible to clients, whether or not they have disabilities. And readily accessible lawyering is beneficial for all types of people. It's helpful for clients with disabilities, clients who aren't fluent in English, or if they're experiencing crisis or have limited bandwidth, such as when they're in jail in the midst of trauma, facing extreme and complex situations like perhaps a divorce, um, or if they're undocumented. It's particularly helpful for clients who are children and who you can expect might need things to be particularly clear and not complicated so that they can understand what is going on. It's also helpful for mitigating the power differential between lawyers and the clients. And finally, it can help you build trust. 
And who is harmed by readily accessible lawyering? Absolutely no one. So um, it's really good for folks to adopt, regardless of whether you're representing a person with disabilities or a person that you know has a disability. When it comes to talking to clients about disabilities, it's important to be straightforward and concrete. Most people with disabilities, whether or not they self-identify as such, they view their disabilities as an everyday part of their lives. It's not horrible or shameful. People aren't necessarily finding it triggering or embarrassing. And the less apologetic and comfortable you are, the better. So you want to avoid saying something like, I'm really sorry to be asking but would you mind if it's okay if I ask, um, if you don't mind me asking if um, you've ever been diagnosed with any mental disabilities? That's not good. That's just going to be awkward for everyone involved. Instead, you can simply say, um, do you have any mental illnesses or conditions like PTSD, depression, or bipolar disorder? Oh. Pardon. Again. Okay, so when you're talking to clients about disabilities, you want to ask about disability accommodations in a simple, non judgmental way. For example, you can say, Is there anything I can do to help us communicate clearly or help you access this meeting fully? Sometimes people, or you could say, Sometimes people have trouble keeping track of dates and times for meetings. Would it help if I sent you a text reminder the day before we meet? And you want to listen to what the person says. They usually know what works. But some people have not yet had a chance to get good accommodations. So you can take I'm not sure seriously and try to brainstorm some solutions. Now, for plain language, simple plain language is part of readily accessible lawyering. It helps people with disabilities and everyone else. You want to avoid legalese whenever possible. Clients don't like it. You know, judges don't even like it a lot of the time. So it makes for stronger lawyering in general. It's also beneficial, like we said, for people experiencing trauma, information overload, drug or alcohol withdrawal, or great transition. And this applies to many clients, regardless of whether or not they have a disability. It helps to reduce the huge power disparity between you and your client. And it's a best practice even before you discuss the existence of disability. And what plain language does is it unpacks and explains implied knowledge using clear common words. So instead of saying, this case is speaking injunctive relief only, try saying, in some kinds of lawsuits, people are asking for money because of something unfair that happened to them. But in this case, we are not asking for money. We are just asking for changes in the jail to protect people. We will not ask you for money, but we want to make sure you understand that you won't get any money from this case. Now, if you compare the two examples, the latter example is more straightforward. It explains it better it actually gives more information to the client than the version at the top. So we think it's important um, for you to think about how you would communicate this to someone who didn't go to law school, who may not have the same level of formal education or who might be a child. And if you can adopt that sort of framework, you'll be better at communicating with your clients regardless of if they have a disability. This document, um, so this is an example of a plain language retainer. Um, I'm not going to read it out um, because we will be sharing the slides, but you can look at it and see how it explains in very straightforward terms what is happening for the case at hand. Okay, for plain language declarations, they're more compelling to the court for one, they're more meaningful to the client, and they give the client an opportunity to tell their story. There's nothing more satisfactory, uh, very few things are more satisfactory to a client than seeing a declaration and buying into it and being able to agree like, yes, this is correct, this is my story, 
this is captured fully. And it's a great opportunity to bond and build and demonstrate trust with your clients. And this is an example of a plain language declaration. And so, as you can see, it uses language that the client actually uses and relies on client input and how best to say something, deferring to the client on their story. Okay, so next we're going to explore capacity, communication, and supported decision making. Capacity exists on a spectrum. It's not a yes or no question. It changes with the context, the topic, and emotional or physical state, et cetera. Capacity for representation does not require a client to fully understand all of the nuances of litigation. I mean, I'm sure we all know attorneys who are transactional attorneys and they themselves don't fully understand all the nuances of litigation. It's fine, that's what we're here for. Capacity is changeable. It can be strengthened using tools such as readily accessible lawyering with plain language. You can also strengthen capacity with reasonable accommodations such as time of day, format, duration, locations of meeting, breaks, and repetitions. Sometimes um, to help a client understand, you might need to draw a chart and something as simple as that can help clients to be able to have the capacity um, for representation. You can also strengthen capacity with supported decision-making. And when you're assessing the capacity of a client, you assess it with the supports. So if a client with supports, like supported decision-making, is able to have capacity, that's the correct answer, that they do have capacity um, because of the supports that they have available. So what is this supported decision-making? An indiv supporting decision making is an individualized arrangement in which an adult with a disability chooses one or more persons that they trust as supporters to help them understand, make, communicate, implement, or act on their own choices. And what's key here is it's their own choices that they're being supported in implementing. And it acts as an alternative to conservatorship or guardianship and it can strengthen the capacity of persons with disabilities and avoid the need for conservatorship or guardianship. So what are an attorney's obligations and responsibilities with a client using supported decision-making? There's a new law in California, AB 1663, which formally represents, sorry, formally recognizes supported decision-making. Supported decision-making can be a reasonable accommodation, which is, as Claudia mentioned, a change to standard practice to ensure that disabled clients have equal access to representation. And remember, you always assess capacity, you always assess capacity with supports. AB 1663, um, passed in 2022, is the Probate Conservatorship Reform and Supported Decision-Making Act. It recognizes supported decision-making as a valid way for people with disabilities to strengthen their capacity and make their own choices. Supported decision-making means an individualized process of supporting and accommodating an adult with a disability in order to enable them to make life decisions. A supported decision-making agreement is a voluntary written agreement written in plain language that's accessible to the disabled adult. It needs to be signed by the disabled adult and each supporter and either signed by a notary public or two neutral witnesses. And it should be reviewed every two years. Um, the act upon appropriations also creates a program to educate and provide information about alternatives to conservatorship like supported decision-making that would be housed at Superior Court self-help centers. It also requires consideration of alternatives to conservatorship, such as SDM, at various points in the conservatorship process, including petition and annual review. It makes it easier for people in conservatorship to get out, including by appointing counsel in termination and allowing for uncontested terminations. 
It requires conservators to keep conservatees informed of choices, rights retained, and as far as possible to use supported decision making within conservatorships and to make choices aligned with the conservatees' wishes. Um, key provisions of um, the bill related to SDM, sorry, provisions of the law related to SDM are here. Okay, now I'm turning it over to Claudia. Thank you, Aisha. I'll wait for my video to get swapped. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about third party supporters and privilege. Um, obviously, when we're talking about um, supporters and you're thinking about an attorney client relationship, it's unsurprising that we would think about what will a third party do to attorney client privilege. And I'm going to walk us through um, the different rules and laws about um, uh, third parties and attorney client privilege. And then I will share with you what I think are the um, practices that you can choose to use to uh, balance uh, attorney client privilege um, protection and including supporters. Okay, so the first um, is rule 1.6 of the rules of professional responsibility which says that a lawyer shall not reveal information protected from disclosure by the Business and Professions Code, Section 6068, unless you have informed consent, or there is an exception that applies, which um, is about crimes, which hopefully is not gonna come up for any of us. Next slide. So what does that be a Business and Professions Code say. Um, so this is a very serious um, provision, and it says that the lawyer has a duty to maintain inviolate the confidence and at every peril to himself or herself to preserve the secrets of his or her client. Okay, so that's um, very, um, every peril to ourselves to preserve secrets. That's a very important rule. Next slide. So the next thing to look at is the evidence code, which is how the state of California defines when um, a party can assert the privilege in court. Um, so that is California evidence code section 952 and 954. And the client has the privilege under our evidence code to refuse to disclose confidential communications between the client and lawyer. And then there's definitions uh, for all those terms. And so the confidential communication is something that is transmitted between the client and the lawyer within that relationship. So it's not like you're buddies with your lawyer and you're doing something outside of that relationship. It's within the attorney-client relationship and in confidence. And so what does that mean, in confidence? And what the evidence code says is that it means that you are disclosing information in a way that is it, in a way that discloses no to no third persons other than those present to further the interest of the client in the consultation or those to whom disclosure is reasonably necessary for either transmitting the information or accomplishing the goal of the attorney-client consultation. So you're going to be looking at, does this further the interest of the client or is it reasonably necessary? That's what the evidence code says. Um, and, uh, so obviously, um, you know, we're, we have sign language interpreters here. Um, people may have language interpreters. This type of rule has long been used to include um, or to permit the presence of such third parties without breaking the, the privilege, without um, 
you know, upsetting the client's ability to refuse disclosure. So um, if you look at these rules, you know, furthering the interest of the client or where disclosure is reasonably necessary, you can see how these may um, include um, someone like an, an interpreter, but also someone like a supporter. Next slide. So if you dig a little bit more into that California Evidence Code, you will bring up the Law Revision Commission comments. And what these commission comments say, say is that communication to a lawyer by a client is nonetheless confidential, even if it's made in the presence of another person, such as a spouse or parent, who is present to further the interest of the client in the consultation. So this is just another um, um, authority that um, supports the idea that um, the participation of a supporter when it's either necessary or furthers um, the representation does not, you know, cause the privilege to go away. Um, next slide. Another important authority for this concept that we're talking about it comes from ABA model rule 1.14, the comments, the comments from to model rule 1.14. And the reason that I'm referring you to the model rule is that the state of California has not actually adopted rule 1.14. And the reason is that rule 1.14 allows an attorney to break the privilege to seek protective action. So in other states, not California, that have adopted this rule, a lawyer can break the privilege if they think that the client needs some sort of protective action. In other words, if the lawyer thinks that the client no longer has capacity and as a result is experiencing harm they're being defrauded or they're being abused and so on. So in other states, I assume there's a test that you have to go through. I just don't know it because we don't have it in this state. Um, you can do protective action. That's not true in California. We do not have that rule. So I like to say sometimes we are mandatory non-reporters. You know, a lot of people have jobs where they're mandatory reporters. We're mandatory non-reporters. But in any event, when you look at the model rule, there are some comments that are still persuasive authority, in my opinion, in California, because it talks about how to support people with disabilities, because protective action is typically raised in the um, context of people with disabilities. So the comment says, the client may wish to have family members or other persons participate in discussions with the lawyer when necessary to assist in the representation. So that's similar to the our evidence code in California. Our evidence code says where necessary or when it advances the representation. The presence of such persons generally does not affect the applicability of the attorney client evidentiary privilege. And the comments reiterate that the lawyer should look to the client and not to family members for decisions in the representation. Um, so next slide. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about case law, about um, this question about third parties as supporters um, that are present with the lawyer and the client. So one case is from the California Supreme Court from 2008. It's People versus Karasi. And in this case, the um, Supreme Court looked at those clauses from the evidence code that I was talking about and then went and looked at that commission comment that I talked about where it was a, a, an individual meeting with their lawyer and their spouse was present. And um, later that person became a criminal defendant. And so there was an issue about whether there was attorney-client 
privilege in that meeting. So ultimately, the California Supreme Court found that they didn't need to decide the question. Um, those of you who have experience with criminal law will know that a lot of times questions aren't decided if the court finds that there's no um, prejudice to the defendant. They say, we don't need to decide because even if it had gone the other way, no prejudice. Um, so the court did not decide it, but I'm referencing it here because it's a very similar fact pattern. Um, in this case, the spouse who, you know, was kind of positioned as a supporter and where they really looked at that language from the evidence code and the commission comment. Um, so it just kind of shows that our courts um, should be taking those that language seriously. You know, it's not just a little piece of um, legal arcana. It's actually, you know, something to look at. Um, the other case that I think is interesting is from the District of Idaho. So in our circuit, but, you know, a lot of these um, attorney-client issues are determined by state law. So I don't know if it matters if this is in our circuit, but it is in our circuit. Um, and it found that the communications at the attorney client with the client supporter present were protected by the privilege where the attorney reason reasonably believed that the supporter's presence was necessary for the client who had anxiety and wanted a supporter present. So two cases on this. Next slide. Now here's the case that'll give you a panic attack on the other side. Um, so this is from the Colorado Supreme Court in 2018. Um, and this was a controversial case. There was a dissent. But in this case, there was a meeting between a plaintiff and a lawyer with the parents present as supporters. And the court ordered the production of a tape recording of that initial legal consultation, finding that the plaintiff did not demonstrate that her parents were objectively necessary to the consultation. Um, the plaintiff had, had argued that the parents were necessary due to diminished capacity caused by the stroke. Um, so, you know, in this case, they were focused on reasonable. They didn't have the language that we have in our evidence code around advancing um, the goals of the representation. You know, they didn't have the law commission comment that we have and so on. But still, this is quite distressing um, if for those of us thinking about um, working with supporters. Um, next slide. So how do we kind of balance all of this um, that I've just gone through? So this is my set of practical tips uh, for meeting with clients who may want or need the participation of supporters. And you all will need to make your own decisions about how to balance all of these important um, considerations. So um, I meet with the client alone to determine their preferences, to verify that um, they uh, want to have a supporter or they don't want to have a supporter or how they want to communicate and so on. Um, I make my own assessment about whether the participation of the supporter is necessary or would advance the interest of the client in representation. If I allow a supporter to participate in any way, I clearly state to both the client and the supporter that all information and communications are confidential and the client makes all the decisions, not the supporter. Now you can consider putting all of this in writing and having people sign it if you want. Um, I have at times put this in retainer agreements to underscore both the confidentiality and, the, and who the client is, but there can be pros and cons. Um, some supporters may be deterred by playing that role um, if they you know, feel uncomfortable signing a legal agreement um, you know, you may um, think about what might be discoverable um, and so on. I mean, it shouldn't be discoverable, but, you know, you just might want to think about whether you want a document. 
Um, so based on that Colorado case, I think it's really important to think twice about an audio recording plus a supporter. So I think what the um, one of the big reasons, in my mind anyway, that the Colorado case was so dramatic is that there was a tape recording of the meeting that ended up being produced to the other side. So say somebody asks for the accommodation of a tape recording um, to listen to afterwards. And then they also ask for the accommodation of a supporter being present. So that's something I think I would think twice about. I've never had anyone ask for that, but I would definitely think twice um, because um, the tape recording would be, um, you know, would bring in the possibility of, you know, if all your arguments failed, which hopefully they wouldn't, um, you would that that tape recording would would um, or audio recording. You can tell I'm old saying tape recording. Uh, the audio recording, um, you know, would exist. Um, so just something to think twice about. Um, and then to document in your client um, file the basis for allowing the participation of supporters. So to have a memo to file that says why you've decided to have supporters um, play a role. Next slide. Um, so um, before I get into protective action, I'll just talk a little bit about um, how supporters can help clients with disabilities. So I've talked about having them in meetings to help the client um, understand or communicate information, um, but they can also help with logistics of um, uh, attorney-client relationships. They can help with meetings, they can help with transportation, um, they can help um, communicate information in an accessible way, although hopefully we won't need that too much if you're um, using plain language. Um, uh, yeah, so those are some of the ways that a supporter can help. It's not always in the meeting, but it can be, you know, around getting the person uh, to the meeting, um, helping them understand what documents are, what communication means, maybe helping with if something needs to be printed out, helping with that, so all different things. Um, I also want to talk a minute before I get into productive action about plain language. So um, DREDF and um, a lot of different partners in the disability community have been really trying to advance plain language as a tool for accessible representation. Um, and for example, the ACLU has done work on this. Um, ASAN, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, does a lot of this work on this. I'm sure I'm forgetting people. Um, so plain language is typically trying to bring things down to fourth or fifth grade um, reading level. And there are some tools in your Word program um, for testing um, the reading level um, of your document. And um, it can be really interesting to see how high the reading level is for things like retainers or um, settlement agreements or other documents that we expect clients to understand. Um, so what we've done historically is to really work on rewriting um, documents into plain language using the automated tool and um, tweaking in order to bring the reading level down. And it, it can be quite time consuming, but very worthy because you really um, have end up with a very clear understanding of what you're trying to communicate in clear English. Um, so DREDF has been working on a set of retainer agreements um, since we are a support center in the legal services community. My goal is to make those available um, publicly and certainly to other legal services providers um, once we have a set that we're happy with. Um, I also wanted to share that I recently went to a conference where I attended a session on the use of artificial intelligence in the area of um, legal services. And so this year I am going to experiment with um, 
asking artificial intelligence to do a first draft of something um, from a high level of English into fourth to fifth grade reading level. And we'll see how that goes. And next year, when we do this session again in January 2025, I will, I will report back on how effective that is um, for doing a first draft. So we'll see. Um, so now uh, back to protective action. Next slide. Okay, so like I said before, um, we do not have protective action in California. We are mandated non-reporters. So what can you do in California if you think your client has diminished capacity and you think it's hurting the representation or you think, you know, the client is in some kind of danger, um, you know, economic or whatever kind of risk of harm. So really your um, options are limited in California. You can continue to represent the client following all the rules. Um, that includes providing reasonable modifications to support capacity. Um, or you can terminate the representation consistent with rule 1.16, which you know, governs how you can withdraw from representation. So you can't tell the court, you can't tell the sister, you can't tell the daughter. Um, this is how you proceed. So again, no um, option in the rules to ask the court for a conservatorship doesn't exist. Next slide. Okay, so um, after the California Supreme Court um, rejected the um, rule 1.14, on protective action. Um, we now have an ethics opinion from the State Bar of California that lays out an alternative for lawyers um, to obtain advanced consent from the client to the lawyer's pr essentially protective action or disclosure of confidential information in the future. In other words, under this ethics opinion, the lawyer can have the client consent in the future if I, lawyer, think you, client, have diminished capacity and you're exposed to harm, you are giving me advance permission to tell the court or tell your daughter or tell somebody um, in order to have some protective action taken, such as um, a conservatorship. Um, the advanced consent is supposed to be obviously informed consent meaning that there would be a review of all of the relevant circumstances, the benefits and the risks. Next slide. Um, it says the opinion, uh, State Bar Ethics Opinion 2021-207 says that this advanced consent is revocable if the client retains the legal capacity to revoke. So you can see that's a little bit of a um, a puzzle because um, if the client then loses their capacity, then they can't revoke and then the lawyer um, would then have the consent to go ahead with the disclosure of confidential information. Um, the lawyer should not act on advanced consent if the client would not have agreed or would have revoked given the change, any change circumstances. And this advanced consent should be memorialized in writing, but not required to be. So it's very interesting. Next slide. So there has been some criticism of this ethics opinion um, that the opinion may allow lawyers to disclose confidential information based on misconceptions about whether the client um, has capacity. So for example, if somebody lost their ability to speak due to a stroke, um, but they could communicate with accommodations, but maybe the lawyer doesn't know how to provide the accommodations and then assumes that the client has lost capacity. So that would be sort of a stereotype about someone who can no longer speak. Um, the, there's also the criticism that this is a workaround 
um, or inconsistent with the California Supreme Court's rejection of Rule 1.14, and that it is a violation of the idea of, um, of keeping attorney-client communications confidential, and that it does not um, require reasonable accommodation or supported decision-making as a first step to um, working with a client. Um, next slide. Uh, so a further critique of the ethics opinion is that the lawyer should be required to check with the client um, and let them know, hey, remember that prior informed consent you gave me to report that, you know, I think you're, you've lost your capacity. Um, uh, you know, I'm about to do that. What do you think about that? But in fact, the, the ethics opinion does not require that the lawyer check in with the client at the time that they plan to disclose the confidential information. So the critique is that, you know, if you're going to do that, you should, um, speak to the client first and the client should have the opportunity to object and revoke the consent. Next slide. All right. So we have a healthy um, amount of time for questions and answers or um, to um, add anything to what we've reviewed. Um, Aisha, I'll, let, I'll give you a chance to jump in here if there's anything um, during my remarks that you thought of that we should cover. Um, one thing that I just would want to add in is the 2021 ethics opinion predates the bill that we talked about before from 2022 that uh, highlights and supports um, supported decision making. So you can always argue that um, the bill um, displaced the ethics opinion even further. And fortunately, we have a lot of questions in the question queue. Um, and we have a hand raised. I believe the hand was raised before. Um, um, do you want me to call on the hand raise, Aisha? Or I can read out loud the um, open questions from in the Q&A. This is tech uh, support. I'm going to allow the person who had their hand raised to speak first. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, Adriana, you can now use audio. Um, my name is Adriana, but I don't I don't have a question. That was a, a mistake. Sorry. That's okay. We can move on to the Q&A box. So we have a question. Are there parameters for what kinds of conditions, disabilities, or situations that would make the presence of a third party appropriate? I'm thinking, for example, of the difference between a client who has anxiety, a client without any mental illness who just feels anxious, a client who is nervous or fearful, and a client who is being affected by their trauma? Um, yeah, that's a really good question and one that I haven't thought about before. So I'll give um, an answer and then I'll pass to Aisha. So, um, you know, supported decision making um, is for people with any um, disability, and supporters can support people with any disabilities. But um, in our um, sort of cultural awareness, I think that people tend to um, think about this as something for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, and potentially psychiatric disabilities. Um, um, and developmental disabilities would include things like CP that might affect someone's ability to speak or might affect um, um, whether uh, it might be helpful for someone who knows their speech really well to re-speak it um, in order to help with communication. So I think that by 
principles, it's, you know, the same principles would apply, but I think culturally or practically, um, people have the most experience and comfort with it around intellectual and developmental disabilities and psychiatric disabilities. Aisha, do you have any thoughts on that question? I would just supplement that by saying um, developmental disabilities um, and reminding folks that developmental disability includes ADHD. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so there are a lot of folks who may not think of themselves as disabled, but would still fall under the ambit of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so there's often a broader basis than might originally be thought. Also, for example, the client affected by trauma, if they have a diagnosis of PTSD, uh, then they're clearly within the ambit of the ADA. And so I think uh, just remembering that the ADA does operate broadly um, can help make sure that you're aware of how how much is covered. Thanks. Um, I also see um, an answered question about CLE credit available for any states other than California. So we are a California MCLE provider and we will provide California credit, but some states allow you to claim credit from other states if certain requirements are met. So you, of course, would need to check that and um, and figure out what you would need to do that. But that sometimes is possible. And okay. we will we will also be sharing written materials, um, which is we know is a component of several states' requirements. Yeah, good point. Um, someone asks. As a matter of practice, if the child of a senior with disabilities comes to you and says they have a power of attorney and want legal representation for the client who is in the hospital, do you typically ask for a copy of the power of attorney or do you take them at their word? Are there any documents you'd ask the person with the power of attorney to sign? That's a really good question. Um, I would certainly ask, so let me just preface this by saying that I, um, although I do, or my practice has included seniors, that's not um, um, a specific um, expert area for me, but I would certainly ask for a copy of the power of attorney. I would not take the person at their word. I mean, I might speak to them generally, but if they were asking that some action be taken, I would definitely want to see the power of attorney first. I don't know if there are other documents I'd want the person to sign. Are you should you have any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I think it would be part of the retainer agreement. You'd want to make clear that they are you're working with them on behalf of um, their parent. And that that person's the client and makes the decisions, right? Yeah. Um, okay, if our client is hospitalized and does not have capacity, either temporarily or permanently, if we do not have the advanced consent, can we not even let opposing counsel or the court know that our client has been hospitalized, for example, to support a request for a continuance? Oh, that's a great question. Um, let me try and think that through. Um, I mean, there's got to be a way that you can let the court know um, because it does advance the representation. Um, I may have to think about this one and get back to you. I think that um, it would, to some extent, go to the um, division between the goals of the litigation and the means of um, trying to reach the goals. So, you know, the lawyer is typically responsible for the day-to-day -day case management, which would include scheduling. And if you know the client is not available because they're in the hospital, um, it would make sense that you would communicate that. Um, and, you know, you might need to consult with uh, next of kin about, um, 
if they're making decisions while the person is in the hospital under a power of attorney, you might need to consult with that person. Um, Aisha, any thoughts on this one? Um, I think it's it's definitely an interesting question because there's a tension between um, the duty not to disclose to the court, but also uh, the duty of diligence to the client. Because if you were to walk away and not request this, um, like a continuance, the client could be prejudiced and have adverse rulings made against them. And so I think it's important to juggle these things. If the client is in a hospital and has no capacity, there's probably someone who has to be making decisions. Um, there's mechanisms for that. And I mean, I agree that if someone has been appointed a person to make decisions for them at that point, it's fine, or it would appear to be okay to to contact them. Um, my understanding of the spirit of the rule is that the lawyer isn't supposed to take unilateral action to have someone have a conservator or guardian appointed for them. But if that situation has already occurred, we're talking about a different case. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Okay, someone says, I'd like to know Claudia's opinions of these ethics concerns. Sorry, there was a frog in my throat. Um, I definitely think that the um, advanced consent op idea where you don't go back to the client and say, hey, I'm about to act on this advanced consent seems really contrary to our rules on um, confidential communications and really contrary to the Supreme Court's rejection of Rule 1.14. Um, I'd be interested to hear from, so I, I think it it's, um, you know, it makes me very uncomfortable and I don't think it's appropriate to have sort of advanced um, consent to uh, seek protective action um, um, and to not even have it be in writing and to not even check with the client again. Um, I'd be interested to hear from lawyers who actually um, try to uh, get this advanced consent. I wonder if it's, I just haven't heard anyone who's um, really um, done this yet, but I don't find it. I find it to be inconsistent um, with our other rules. Aisha, do you have any thoughts? Um, the one thought I would add to what Claudia said is that um, we've we've explained multiple times that you need to assess capacity of your client with supports. So any attorney who is going to be following the ethics opinion and get consent to um, to do. Um, protective action needs to also make sure the client is understanding that they have the the right to supports and also them taking on themselves the duty of educating themselves about what a potential um, supports are available that could make the client have um, enough capacity. It's lazy lawyering to not even do that investigation and then um, seek protective action. Um, so, <laughs> so another question is circling back to the point on whether to have a support person sign a confidentiality agreement. Can you explain again the cons of having a support person sign a confidentiality agreement and any way to mitigate those drawbacks? So I think um, the cons are that um, it may deter some supporters who are uncomfortable signing a legal document, um, just even if to us it's not a big deal to sign it, it may um, deter somebody, um, the anxiety or, or, or um, uh, just seem, seeming burden of, of signing into a legal agreement. Um, and then another con would just be, you know, sort of like the tape recording in that Colorado case that it sort of creates a paper trail about how you're managing your attorney client 
um, meetings. Um, but I don't think, I mean, I could see um, going either way on this. Um, you know, I've had I've had uh, supporters sign a confidentiality agreement before, so I don't see it as you know a hard and fast rule either way. Um, Aisha, any thoughts on that one? No, nothing from me. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Do you recommend documenting the reason for allowing supporters for every communication or interaction? Um, I haven't had this question before, but my um, initial reaction would be, um, no, I probably wouldn't because I'd be nervous that um, I would forget to record it at some point and then somehow that makes it seem like it wasn't um, necessary during that interaction or that it didn't advance the purposes of the representation. So I'd probably just document it at the beginning. Um, Aisha, any thoughts? I would probably document it only at the beginning, unless it's clear that this is like an intermittent um, disability that sometimes requires um, a supporter and sometimes doesn't. And so you could say that um, we're being diligent and only having it when it's actually needed. But outside of that kind of circumstance, I don't know that it would be necessary. Okay, next question. Is the supportive decision making statute only in cases involving conservatorship or is it applicable to other types of litigation? So um, AB 1663 is a general um, law. So it applies generally to all people with disabilities who want to enter into a supported decision making agreement. Um, it can be an informal agreement or it can be a written agreement such as is described in the statute. So it's a tool that can be used um, in litigation or in an attorney client relationship to support a client with a disability. Um, the one of the stated goals of AB 1663 is to avoid conservatorship when a person can maintain their capacity with supports. But the law also talks about using supported decision making even within conservatorship um, to try to allow people, um, even those who are already under conservatorship or in the future will be under conservatorship to allow um, people to express um, their views and have those views implemented um, as much as feasible in the context of a conservatorship. So it's a little bit, um, in some ways, counterintuitive that you would use supported decision-making within a conservatorship, but I think the idea is that it is trying to um, enhance um, somebody's self-determination and we want that to be available to people within conservatorship or, you know, or outside of conservatorship. And it's kind of similar <laughs> to bring up a very controversial topic, um, care courts. So care courts have been adopted in California um, in the face of great opposition from civil liberties and disability rights organizations. Um, and the care court system has this idea of supported decision making within care courts. So, you know, we don't think care courts should even exist, um, you know, but if somebody is in that situation and a supporter um, would be useful to them, then yes, I mean, we think they should have a supporter, but we don't think care courts should even exist because we think the support should be provided voluntarily, which they are not. Um, so that was a really long answer. To confirm, there are no circumstances without written consent or other consent from the client where an attorney can reach out to a third party to obtain support for a client who needs assistance, such as reaching out to adult protective services. Yeah, that's my understanding. You need consent from the client to seek protective action. Um, and so uh, um, uh, I, uh, we could try to find some um, additional material on this, but that's, you know, California is the outlier here. We have 49 other states that have adopted rule 1.14, but not California. 
So, um, you know, I think that in our state, it's incumbent on us to um, speak to clients plainly and say, you know, it seems like X, Y, Z is happening. It seems like you are at risk from of, you know, such and such fraud or such and such abuse. I'd really like to reach out to someone to help you. I'd really like to talk to your daughter um, and try to get consent to those kinds of actions because my reading of the rules um, is that we don't have that option in California to unilaterally um, seek out protective action. Um, Aisha, any thoughts on that? I think that's correct. Um, I mean, the only sort of area where I think we could reach out would be um, uh, the rule around disclosure of criminal activity. Um, but I don't think that's what most of us are thinking of. Right, right. Um, I'd like to, okay, here's a question. I'd like to support and communicate with my client the best that I can, but don't want to overstep. I'm wondering how to practically and more definitively determine whether a client requires assistance or support when they don't give that disclosure immediately. I feel that it's easiest to ask right out during initial communications, but I don't want to make assumptions and come off as insensitive during any initial impressions with the client. Thank you for your help. Aisha, you want to try this one? Sure. Um, so this can be tricky. Um, it really um, depends on the relationship that you have with your client, and that can build over time. And so what um, I find to be helpful is to leave the door open and let them know that if uh, your goal is to have a successful representation um, or fruitful one, and if there are anything that they need um, to make that representation happen, that you know, you're happy to have that conversation. Sometimes it takes um, folks a little while to let you know what they need. Um, I've had people have conversations with me and they would tell me maybe 10% of what the need was. And um, just to sort of, um, as a feeler, to see if um, I was receptive. And then maybe the next time we spoke, they would tell me another 10% of what the need was. And so sometimes it's just something that you need to be patient with and give folks time to feel comfortable to open up. Yeah, I think that's right. Thank you, Aisha. Um, so here's a very hard question. So if we believe the client has diminished capacity, in fact, get the client tested and dementia is established, I cannot disclose that to the court without the client's permission. In immigration court, there are protections for clients with mental disabilities, so it is in the client's interest to disclose it to the court, and ultimately the court would notice it at the hearing because it's evident, and the court ultimately may find the lawyer was ineffective and did not help the client when the disability is obvious, and the attorney failed to apprise the court and seek protections. So I understand, um, I'm not an immigration lawyer, but I understand that there is a um, fulsome discussion in the immigration um, world about how to navigate um, these competing requirements. And um, I imagine that um, people should call the ethics hotline, they should consult with in-house counsel um, to try to figure out how to do this. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, one way is to, um, try to focus on um, having the client uh, identify the goals of the litigation and then looking to it, you know, the goals are that you have a good experience in immigration court and um, we think having a lawyer for you would help you in immigration court, in, in the immigration proceeding. We think that giving this report will allow you to have a lawyer and that would be um, better for you. Um, so trying to get the client to buy into the goals or express the goals, not buy into them, because uh, express their goals in the proceeding and um, then uh, agree to disclosing the report. 
Um, there, the judge um, will notice and should intervene and and provide any attorney, you know, lawyers that are required under case law under Franco or whatever other case is applying. I may have the case wrong. I'm not a disability lawyer. And, um, you know, they, the judge should not be mad at the lawyer because if, if the lawyer is in California, um, because the lawyer is trying to follow um, the Supreme Court's rejection of Rule 1.14. Um, you know, some people um, with dementia may, well, maybe not in immigration detention, but may, in other settings, may have a power of attorney. There may be a tool already in place. So as long as you, the lawyer, don't create the, you know, you can rely on something that's already in place to, to resolve the issue, um, like a power of attorney. Um, uh, but yeah, I think this is a hard one. I understand that there are immigration lawyers out there who are struggling with this. Um, you know, might be time to talk to the ethics hotline and to, um, you know, maybe even ask for an ethics opinion that you could show um, to the judge so you don't get yelled at, because I don't think it would be right to get yelled at. Um, but I, you know, I do think it's proper for the judge to notice and order, um, order counsel where appropriate under the case law. And, um, you know, you could certainly um, say, you know, Your Honor, I we have rules in California to follow and we don't have rule 1.14 in this state. And hopefully they'll understand, but I understand, I, I definitely see the problem. Um, let's see. Oh, wait, I just wanted to add in one more thing. Oh um, yeah, go for it, Aisha. And this is not just dementia, they're, the several psychiatric disabilities where folks might not have insight and that's an aspect of their disability and something that um, folks can try to accommodate around. Um, you can, um, some, like there have been cases where clients don't agree with their diagnosis and still are able to um, make use of the diagnosis or to do what they need to do. Um, we see that all the time with like clients with disabilities um, in the child welfare context, they might have a diagnosis, they may not agree with the diagnosis, but they'll still take the steps that they need to take to get their children back. And that can happen, you know, in immigration. So you might say, listen, you, they say the doctor has said that you have dementia. Maybe you don't have dementia, you know, regardless of whether you do or you don't have dementia, um, you can use what the doctor said. And you don't have to write in the declaration, I believe I have dementia. You can just say, I have received this diagnosis and the judge can do with it what the judge will. And sometimes that works, not always, but sometimes. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And that can happen in, um, even in complaints, um, someone might feel like their diagnosis is wrong or um, they don't consider themselves to have a disability. You could say, you know, so and so, you know, has been deaf since childhood and communicates using ASL, and um, um, based on um, these facts, this person has a disability. And you put it in quotes under the Americans with Disabilities Act, so you are putting it in the legal context rather than assigning it as a, um, you know, a form of identity to the person. But great um, question. I'm glad someone raised that. There was um, a question I, in the oh, chat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, why don't you read that, read that one, Aisha? Okay. This question was typed in the chat earlier. Um, we have clients that say they would like us to speak with, say, mom, dad, partner, friend, etc. So long as that consent is documented, then we are fine, right? Um, yes, it I, well, actually, I'm going to kick this to Claudia. Um, so, I mean, I think you have to look at all the rules um, that we've put in the PowerPoint. We're going to send it out to you all and just make sure you feel you're following all the rules that the, um, you know, it. So what we were talking a lot about the um, 
keeping attorney-client privilege is when um, you are having a meeting with your client and the supporter is somehow involved. And so that's where you have to check that, you know, is this necessary to the communication or does it advance the um, goals of the litigation? And you're going to look at all the rules and case law and make a decision on your own about that. Um, probably document it in the file. Um, in terms of um, communicating with someone um, as a witness, like if you're taking notes about um, someone as a witness, a family member, then you're going to want to put in your impressions and make sure that, you know, that's maintained as a, um, a work product document. Um, if your client asks you to coordinate, for example, coordinate with my daughter on the um, the appointment because she's going to help me get there. She's going to drive me. Yes, that's totally fine. That's like a completely good way to use a supporter. Um, there may be some examples in the middle where um, I feel like I can't give a blanket yes or no, but um, you know, if you've tried to follow the principles, that's the the idea. Do what um, Aisha, um, do you have any thoughts on that one? Um, I I would just you know reiterate that it's important for the client to understand attorney client privilege, and if you're going to if they're going to ask you to make communications that might waive that privilege. Um, we have a question. Are there any resources for plain language documents for settlement releases? Oh, that's a great question because settlement documents are some of the least accessible documents that are, exist out there. I um, do not know of any right now. Um, you can see if you look at the um, ACLU's um, library on supported decision making, you'll see some plain language documents which can um, give you some examples. They aren't settlement releases, but there's some examples. Um, Dredef is working on some retainers, retainer agreements, which we hope to share by the time we do this next year. Um, I see in the chat someone shared that um, the Impact uh, Fund is working on uh, better settlement notices. You can ask them for templates. That's a great um, tip. Um, uh, but yeah, I think especially those general releases and the, you know, you're releasing everything um, from the beginning of time until the date of the settlement agreement. Um, those are really hard to explain. And um, it's that's a real um, bear. Um, let's see, have we answered everything? Let's look. Um, so we're going to share slides. If folks who, um, you know, have represented seniors or immigrants who find the, um, you know, the rejection of Rule 1.14 to be really challenging, um, I'd be interested um, to find out if you, um, you know, how you uh, balance um, the different rules and how you um, decide to navigate things. Um, uh, you know, I could imagine somebody uh, figuring out, oh, well, actually the person's in New Mexico right now in detention and we're going to send a New Mexico lawyer who's in a different state and has different rules. So it'd be interesting for us to learn about that. Um, someone asked, do we need to do anything specific to request an MCLE certificate? No, we're going to send those out. We're going to try to do it by the 31st. Um, I, I don't think you actually need to have received the certificate to do your, um, your attestation, but we will do it so people feel um, at ease. And um, yeah, we'll send them all out, uh, hopefully by Wednesday, to the email that you gave when you registered. Let's see. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Disability advocates collaborated on comments on the proposed ethics rule and why it was problematic if folks are interested. Yeah, thanks, Dara. Dara that's a really good point. When we previously did this presentation, we included that um, comment letter. I think it's on the DRC website as some of the materials. And um, 
this time we just didn't uh, include the link to that. Um, but um, if anyone needs it, feel free to email me. My email is easy to find um, and I'll put it in the chat, um, but I'm happy to share that document. All right. Um, so let's see. It seems like um, we have no more questions. Um, and so, yeah, so um, we've put the um, evaluation form in the chat. Um, you um, can reach out to us with any questions. And as you see, we don't always have perfect answers, but we can try to help you work through things. And particularly if you're from a qualified legal services provider, meaning that you are funded by the state bar to serve indigent people in California, we exist as a support center to you. And we are funded also by the state bar to help you with these kinds of questions. So we definitely encourage you to reach out if you are with a QLSP. And if you don't know what that is, you probably aren't with one, but um, if you are with one, we, we would love for you to reach out. Thank you so much. And thank you for the great questions that really get at the heart of some of these things.